uh, having me. So I'm very glad that uh, we already had these two speakers before because there were already a lot of, uh, sorry, the microphone. Yeah, there were a lot, of, a lot of subjects already that were talked about. So using bigger models and um, doing transfer learning and then uh, the convex hull in the last talk uh, that I will need. So thank you for that. Yeah, so we'll be speaking on machine learning thermodynamically stable materials. And I will start with a small introduction. Why do we actually care about this problem? And point one is that we really need to discover alternatives to current technology. So we have, for example, new demium iron boron magnets that are used in electric cars, and then you need extra dysprosium there. And the production is quite limited. This can become a problem in the future. Uh, for cobalt, um, the production or the demand is projected to increase 50 fold uh, in the next decade. Um, due to lithium batteries as well in electric cars and so on. And then, of course, cobalt is produced in the Democratic Republic of Congo, so there are human rights issues. And yeah, there are a lot of these cases. And the second point is that we would also like to enable new technologies, so like P-type transparent conductors, room temperature transparent ferromagnets, room temperature superconductors, and so on. Everything that would be very nice, but nothing is really there for industry yet or in the case of room temperature superconductors, just under very um, ridiculous conditions. Um, can you even achieve that? So um, in our case, we are not looking for anything specific, but um, our strategy is more widespread, find as many materials as possible, and hope um, then that there are other researchers, uh, researchers interested, and when they know the materials will be stable, to scan them for the properties that they need. And so how do we do this? And the traditional way to find new materials efficiently are prototype based high throughput searches. So we take a structure. You already know the perovskite structure from the last talk, just an example. We fill it in with candidate elements and get a few hundred thousand compositions. Then we uh, use a million or more maybe CPU hours for a ternary composition to do all the geometry optimizations, get the energy, and then we go to the convex hull um, that was introduced in the previous talk. And we have our energy relative to all possible decomposition channels. And yeah, um, then we know the stability if this distance is um, zero. Okay, um, so far so good. But then if we want to do thousands of these ternary prototypes, I mean, um, it becomes really expensive uh, or for quaternaries, we're already at 15 million compositions. So we can't really do this anymore. And yeah, what people have now been doing maybe for the last seven years or so, um, is machine learning. So you predict all the distances to the convex hull with the machine learning model and then just validate the ones closest to stability. And um, in the beginning, um, this was quite limited. So the first models, and we also um, did this maybe five years ago, um, where um, just for a single prototype, you have handcrafted features, decision trees, corner ridge regression, and so on. But it's, I mean, it worked for single prototypes. Then over the last years, people have tried um, more uh, deeper neural networks that were also based on the composition. However, here we have a problem. And this is just, if we consider perovskite structure and here this sodium, uh, sodium uh, nitrogen and um, beryllium three, we don't actually know which um, is in which position in the structure. And so you can't learn the, um, to differentiate these polymorphs properly. So purely compositional models don't work, even though some of them and have good performances on, let's say, materials project um, or similar data sets. Now you could um, extend these representations to an extra dimension to just say, okay, we have one vector um, for each side, but then we are limited to one prototype again, and we can't profit from big data and pre-trained models and so on, um, what as I mentioned already. Okay, so we need structure sensitivity. I think everybody has heard about and these crystal graphs already um, during the last days where we mapped the nodes to, uh, sorry, the atoms of the crystal structure to the nodes. And then the edges, usually people use some distance uh, representation. However, we have this problem and that we really directly want to predict the relaxed energy or the distance to the convex hull of the relaxed structure. And, um, but yeah, um, we don't have the right positions. So we can't really do this. And, um, the idea we had instead, just take the physics out and just say, okay, the atom is the first neighbor. We don't care if it's one angstrom or two. And yeah, just use a embedding for the graph distance. So this is first neighbor, second neighbor, and so on. And then just throw more parameters at it and see if the model learns it. 
So what we have already heard in the first talk a little bit. So our models are not quite large, but also larger for maybe material science and purposes. So we also use a tension mechanism, not the same as in natural language processing, but somewhat similar. And um, yeah, also was used in Roost, for example, another application in material science, we did some small modifications. And, but yeah, let's just say we end up with a message passing network and with maybe 60 million parameters that we want to train. And yeah, I mean, it doesn't need um, as many GPU hours, but maybe um, still a few thousand. And so we thought we also need some more data as we have uh, quite a few parameters. So we curated a, a new data set. So we had a few, and um, by now maybe 2 million calculations of our own group lying around. And then um, uh, there's A-Flow and the materials project. And in the end, um, we ended up with 2.4 million crystal structures and the rather complete convex hull, which is also important for us to determine the stability of the compounds that we are predicting. And you can also find this data set online. Um, so yeah, please uh, go ahead. Maybe it's useful for someone here. Yeah, so then we um, trained um, with this data set. And now it is again one of the pitfalls of this data set that we have already was already mentioned in the first talk. We can get a perfect um, error better chem than chemical accuracy um, on our normal test set that we randomly select. However, um, this is just the in-distribution error. And then if we remove, for example, all mixed perovskites, we had a larger data set of um, these um, lying around. We removed all of um, all the materials with the same composition and space group. And then we end up with this error of 500 milli electron volt per atom. However, and the problem here is also that these materials were rather unstable. So there's a distributional shift of maybe one EV. And if we actually consider only the ones that are closer to stability, we get a more reasonable error. Still not great, but um, yeah, it's okay. And these are anyway the materials we're interested in as the ones at two EV, um, nobody really cares. Okay, so then we um, had the pre-trained model and we wanted to check how good we can get it with some transfer learning for the specific data set. And um, yeah, as you can see, the blue um, curve of the pre-trained model always performs better than the model without pre-training, um, especially in the lower data regime. And then we have some um, other um, purely compositional model that um, was changed to, I mean, differentiate this polymorphs and yeah, it's not really competitive. Okay, so um, then we had the model and as we already had it, we also did a high throughput search of these uh, mixed perovskites. And you can see here the, in orange, the training distribution and then in blue, the predicted systems or that we validated with DFT. So we validated everything below, I think 200 milli electron volt. And yeah, um, we found um, quite a few stable ones. And we think that um, with distortions, or we know this from a different study that we have done on these mixed perovskites, that you can stabilize them by more than 100 milli electron volt often with distortions. So maybe a few more of these will be stable in the end. Um, another interesting metric maybe, um, so here the predictions for the unrelaxed structure. So when we go from the unrelaxed structure to the energy of the relaxed structure, this is the convex hull, um, are actually really good now, um, even though we, um, only enter this graph distance and it's really competitive to if we start with the relaxed structure. And um, we use one small trick here and that is we use a few different cell constant ratios. So we do a few more predictions for each composition for, in this case, just take the minimum energy and this way we get a better prediction for the um, relaxed uh, structure from the unrelaxed one. Okay, so up to here, this was all already published and now these are some new results. So. We started with this pre-training uh, or continued with this pre-training for um, a few more, maybe 15 more compounds and produced some more um, DFD calculations, um, 400,000. And then roughly we retrained the model and it's now performing better. One big problem was before that um, nobody had really sampled lanthanides and actinides um, a lot. So the error for this was higher before and now, yeah, they are better sampled and with better performance there. Uh, then we also train them, uh, train the model to predict volume. So we have to do less geometry optimization steps in the end. And now we just work on doing a lot uh, of high throughput searches. So um, we're trying to do all binary, ternary, and quaternary 
prototypes that we have with less than 20 atoms in the unit cell and yeah, not um, uh, space group numbers larger than 10. And that appeared at least 10 times in our database. And this uh, next slide actually um, changed even yesterday. So um, before yesterday, we just had uh, maybe 1,300 of these um, ternary prototypes um, done, but now we have read all the output files of the WASP calculations. And now we have um, yeah, searched these um, roughly 1 billion compounds. And um, yeah, you can see you can see the median uh, distance at the convex hull for the predicted um, ternaries and binaries here. So 50 for the binaries that are a lot easier, and 100 for the ternaries. And then we found um, yeah more than 23,000 compounds that were below our previous hull, um, which is um, quite a lot, and below 10 milli electron volt, which is still super close to stability. And um, we found another um, yeah we found 43,000 in total. And maybe just to give a um, small impression of the scale, um, below this white line here, we have um, roughly 1.6 times as many inorganic crystal structures as we have in the materials project. So below 100 milli electron volt. And yeah, so now we're just left with the quaternaries and have to see um, how they will go. Okay, so. To summarize, um, the crystallograph attention networks can actually predict properties accurately from unrelaxed structures and discover um, new materials. Now, the challenges um, that we are facing directly are mostly related to the data. At least, um, these are the most um, pressing for us. So this element bias I already talked about, we think that this will be corrected more or less just through doing more and more throughput searches and it's getting better. Prototypes are different because we will always do calculations for or predictions for prototypes that we haven't sampled yet. Um, and so we wanted to do some active learning there. So far we weren't um, that successful, but already learned a lot at this conference and talked um, to all people that I found that did active learning. And maybe with this knowledge now we can be more successful there. Yeah, then the second point is really this accuracy of DFT. So we use the PBE functional and um, right now, like I um, mean, basically everybody in the community who does high throughput calculations. Um, but it's quite uh, inaccurate for formation energies, actually, or the errors are unreasonably large in comparison to our machine learning models. And so um, we recently published a data set of 175,000 uh, PBE sole geometry optimizations with scanned single point calculations. And these um, the scan calculations should have a better um, formation energy or distance to the convex hull for most material groups. So there's also available online and it's also maybe 10 million or 15 million cores, something in this um, region. So uh, please be free to use it. And so um, that, uh, yeah, we get something out of um, this money or basically someone can profit from it. Yeah, and also maybe um, there are band gaps for these um, with scan as well and uh, high camp sampling. Maybe it's also interesting for someone. Okay. And yeah, then um, we are just left to explore the space of all the other known prototypes. And then afterwards, we have to see what will happen. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, uh, of course, most importantly, uh, I didn't do um, this work alone. So there are a lot of people involved um, with uh, this project. And I would like to uh, thank especially my supervisor, Miguel Marx, who also, despite being a supervisor, does an unreasonable amount of calculations and this helps a lot. <laughs> okay, yeah, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jonathan, for a wonderful talk. How about some questions? Yes. Hello, uh, great talk. Um, I'm just a bit curious, I guess, about what your strategies are going to be with trying to, uh, I guess, uh, like from the point of view of the quality of your data, like you said, the PBE may not, you know, may present a sorry, challenge. Yeah. Oh, um, sorry, yeah. can you hear me? Yeah, now, now it's better, yeah. Okay, um, you mentioned there is uh, some challenges using the PBE functional. Have you, what are your plans to I guess. Uh, yeah, so basically correct. the problem is that the, I mean, one problem is that there's also very little um, experimental data on formation energies. So nobody can be 
that sure even how good the PBE actually is, but from what we know, um, the scan functional should perform better than even the PBE with the materials project corrections. And um, so that's the main thing. And of course, scan um, geometries are also more accurate. Um, we don't do scan geometry optimizations because they are um, difficult to converge. So that's why we choose the PBE sold here that has as accurate geometries. So it's kind of a cheap way to get there. Okay. And yeah, then what we're doing right now is transfer learning. Again, we have the pre-trained models, which is a big advantage. And of course, um, um, we also have the code online, although it's more one of these PhD student codes and not um, the Facebook research uh, engineers. And, but um, yeah, and okay. then we are transfer learning to the PB soul and scan data. Okay, All right. thank you. So not the student codes. We've all learned a lot from them. Any more questions? Oh, yeah, Zoom. It's actually not a Zoom question, but my own. So now that you've done, you, you've studied so many materials and, and you've got the distances to the convex hull, what, what are you doing with the results? Yeah, so, I mean, for the last, like um, 100,000 DFT calculation, we just finished reading the output files yesterday. So we haven't done anything yet, but of course, I mean, we'll do a lot of statistics to see actually what are the distributions, for example, um, for the stable compounds and so on in this uh, ternary compound space, especially because it's not really, I mean, um, known um, that well yet. And then, I mean, we um, will, for the stable ones, calculate some basic properties, um, like are they ferromagnetic, what's the band gap and so on. Um, with higher quality and yeah then um we will i mean obviously um, publish the data and um yeah advertise it and hope that um, people find use of it <laughs> okay and of course we will try to contact um as many experimentalists as possible to synthesize some of these materials especially new material groups that haven't been found so far mm. and so um, i mean we had a few experimentalists here so if any are interested in um, some completely new material groups and synthesizing them, please talk to us. We would be super happy. Okay, thank you. Actually, I had a question very similar uh, along these lines. So you've created a gigantic database. This is very helpful. And you seem to be searching for stable materials of many different compositions yeah. uh, within there. But then your title was about thermoelectrics, right? So I'm guessing you're Sorry? scanning your title. Uh, was just thermodynamics. Oh, thermo oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. I was just wondering if there's any particular class of functionality that you're interested in, or if you're just planning for the stable materials just to compute a range of potentially useful functional properties, and then many people can use them in different ways. Yeah. Or so some... right, yeah, right now, I think, um, or we see that there are some needs maybe for some materials in the near future, 10 years, I mean, with um, okay. what's happening. And so we thought that this is the um, most efficient way and these are all low-hanging fruits i mean these are the known prototypes and but if we can find maybe i mean fifty thousand structures close to stability in a year or two and with this then i hope there's something useful there and then yeah we can't i'm i'm not really an expert on the material science but i think there are a lot of people who uh, who are and maybe can find something useful Great. Then also one thing I wanted to add is now there's been in the last year or two quite a lot of works on synthesizability or predicting machine learning synthesizability. So I think this is like a step forward beyond like finding which ones are, are stable, energetically stable. Yeah. Uh, then from these, then there's some works trying to predict which ones of these then there are synthesis routes for. So you can also like add this on on top of what you're doing now to yeah. make it even to boost it even more to all other um, people who already know what they are doing there can just take <laughs> the data. Um, yeah, but also um, true. for sure, there's um, a lot of things that can still be done. And I mean, right now we maybe tell experimentalists maybe one in four, so they try and might be stable. Um, but this, sure. can, this can help a lot, definitely. Okay, I see one last question. Yes, let's have it. Thanks a lot, really interesting stuff. Um, it's not really a question, more a suggestion or a thing that would be really, I'd be really interested to see. So um, I don't know if you know Chris Wolverton of the OQMD, so they have a database about a lot of uh, also convex hulls like this. He did this really cool thing where he did a, the convex hull for the entire 
uh, periodic table. So one hull for all the compounds. So if you do this and then maybe use Alessandro Lyle's tools to calculate the intrinsic dimensionality, maybe we can know what the intrinsic dimension of all of the known solids for now are. So if you do it, if you think you can do it, I'd be super interested to know what that number is. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not, I don't think I'm entirely sure yet um, where you're going. But I'm sure, I think we can definitely discuss it in the break afterwards because it sounds very interesting. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Thank you, Jonathan, again for your presentation. And now let's welcome our next speaker. Okay, our next speaker is Felix Arendt from the group of Marek Sierka at Jena, and uh, he'll be talking about machine learning applied to glass materials. So thank you very much. Yeah, good morning. Um, my talk will be about the evaluation of descriptors for property predictions of glasses by the means of machine learning. 